I'd like to thank uh, Sir Dan first for the invitation to speak here today. And secondly, I know I'm standing between you and a golf game or a tour or something like that, so I'll try and make this as quick and painless as possible. I think I can skip the bio, very good job. So it's gave me a slide and saved everybody about 30 seconds. So I think one of the things that I wanted to start with before I talk about my own experience and so on, just to kind of summarize a few things that we've seen this week, so to speak, or in the last few days, we're all excited about AI. I think that's really, really clear. I think we're excited about, as an industry, as a healthcare industry, about saving lots of money because ultimately the purpose of AI is to drive efficiency and ultimately there's about $100 billion of forecasted efficiencies here in the future. I think as an industry and as a vendor, we're excited about making lots of money, obviously. You know what I mean? I think that, you know, as an industry, we forecast, you know, 10 billion by 2024 in the healthcare industry. And again, this is really, really exciting uh, for, for a player in the industry today. I think that we'll live up to the hype. Keith yesterday uh, explained the hype cycle in great detail to us, but I think that one of the key things is if we think back maybe five, ten years ago, digital pathology probably was at the top of that hype cycle as a general concept. It's probably down here now. It's starting to get into the, the area of providing some practical and kind of niche use cases and people are starting to get positive about it. But ultimately it disappointed for a long time in the middle, you know what I mean? So again, with artificial intelligence, we have to be reticent that ultimately there's a strong potential to underwhelm users in the next sort of two to five years. And you know, we saw examples like your, your uh, delusional um, uh, GANs yesterday, for example, is a good case in point. Um, there's about 100 million in deployed capital. I think you come up with a number like 70 million yesterday, Keith. I think you also look at internal programs within some of the large corporates. I think that's about where we're at, okay? So from my perspective as, a, as an investor, let's put my investor hat on here, 100, bill, 100 million of capital deployed equals about a billion of five-year ROI, which would probably equal about 500 bill, million of sales in a five to 10-year time horizon per annum in this area. Digital pathology as an industry right now, guys, is about 300 million. So we have to think about that in the context of the amount of capital being deployed today, and ultimately some of this capital will disappoint their investors. You know, and that's the reality of the situation because ultimately these type of ROIs are just not achievable. So, but lots of players, lots of interest, lots of appetite, lots of people out there, including ourselves. Even Google are doing it. We've seen Google dipping their toe in the water here, you know? So why are people doing it? Because the time is now. I think we're seeing that image recognition is exceeding human capability now in certain studies, okay? And again, that might be on cats or dogs, but we also saw examples yesterday where it clearly doesn't work as well, okay? Like horses, I think, if I remember. But, so, but deep learning in pathology is built on a digital pathology foundation, okay? So it's really, really important. We can't do deep learning without images and without digital pathology. And in that context, there's lots of great tech out there. I haven't really selected any vendors in, in specific. As I said, if I've left anybody out, I apologize sincerely. But I think not only do you have hardware, like the scanning stuff, you also have things like cloud-enabled GPU clusters, which are very, very important for machine learning. You've all of these frameworks like Keras, TensorFlow, all these things, Google machine learning. And you've infrastructure like Amazon, where you can just put up infinite amounts of content and scale your, scale your repositories almost infinitely, okay? So plenty of content around. So we think contextual understanding of tissue is now theoretically, maybe even practically possible in certain use cases. But how bad do you actually want it or need it is the question. And I think, you know, we've seen that in the industry, for example, you've got increasing disease, aging pathologists, increasing complexity of diagnosis. We've seen that all the time. And also more tests for patients. We just heard earlier just about how lung, lung pathology has changed over the last five, 10 years. So effectively, all these things are driving pressures on the industry to deliver, but ultimately on the flip side, you know, you have either a flat or slightly declining pathologist base, okay? So, you know, when people are worried about getting replaced, I think they should be worried about how they're gonna keep up with the work that's coming in, effectively. And, you know, in a way, that's what AI can support people with, I think, to some extent. I think we're also seeing the industry themselves recognize the, the, that ultimately they can't fill these supply demand skill sets, particularly in toxicological pathology, which is veterinary pathology. There's a real challenge there. And you know, people talk about we're rapidly heading to a future where neural networks will prompt diagnoses and treatments. And you know, that's the kind of the general philosophy out there. So, okay, all sounds great. You know, we have the supply demand problems, we have the tech, we have everything. So what are we waiting for? Let's get on with it, okay? But, you know, we, we have to understand, and this is very much a vendor's view 
on the problems I face in trying to develop and deploy a clinically validated solution that will diagnose cancer or do something to that effect. Okay, first things first, histopathology is hard for us techies in question mark, in quotation marks, because effectively, I think, you know, it is such a, a deep skill and something that's learned over many, many years and ultimately is a huge challenge. I think I looked at this first and I said, oh, that looks like, what, what is that? I wonder, is that inflammation? And somebody said, no, it's a thing called hematopoiesis. And I was there, well, what's that, you know? But there you go, but that's the point I'm trying to make. It's very difficult for us to kind of, as technologists, to understand the problem we're trying to solve. If you're building a self-driving car, you drive to work that morning, you understand the problem, you understand the fundamentals of the problem, but as a technologist, we have to understand this stuff, these blue dots and pink backgrounds, and make some sense of them. So, as a result, we need pathologist help, and there's lots and lots of annotating required, and you know, marking things on tissue, and saying, that's the interesting part, that's that feature, and so on. So that's a really hard challenge for us. And I suppose that's driven predominantly by the kind of current approach to supervised image classification, where you take a bunch of control content, you take a bunch of sample content A, you feed that into a network, and you hope you get predictive outcome as a result of that. And as a result of that, you start getting all these tiny little annotations here, 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 even this one here, for example, where you have an abnormal area with a normal area in the midst of it. So, you know, you've got these type of challenges in terms of getting pathologists who are really, really under pressure, a really high cost resource, to be frank, as, a, as an industry, and ultimately trying to get them to draw things on, on images, which is a complete waste of their time to some extent. So, processing and scanning artifacts are normal, okay? So on that basis, you know, the quality of the material we're looking at varies. Okay, so this is just literally different staining on different, you know, different kidney examples here or different staining on different liver examples here. So you're just, your baseline is all over the place. You've got imaging system variants. This is just two images, one from an Aperio scanner, one from a Hamamatsu scanner. Not only do they look different in color, but if you look closely, there's a different texture in them as well. So again, this stuff just screws up machine learning. It just doesn't like it. You know what I mean? You say, well, that's different to that. Why are you showing me that? You've got scanning and processing artifacts. Here's a you know, processing artifact, and here you can see striping in this image here, which is a result of a poorly calibrated instrument. So effectively, that's a challenge for us. And then we have lots of variability in reported findings. Pathologists, Pete said yesterday, you ask three pathologists, you get four answers. And us trying to train a system based on having four answers to one problem you know, is really, really challenging. And again, you know, we just went back and looked at a random bunch of papers. We just put in Kappa statistics into, into the internet and basically got a number. And you know, Kappa statistics are kind of average. They can be poor, moderate, fair, you know, but they're not great in certain use cases. So the other thing that we see, and we see it more so in toxicological pathology, is that normal is relative. So for example, here, this is just a variance in the amount of glycogen in this liver. Basically, this has got a lot of glycogen, this is very little glycogen. But they're both perfectly fine, both perfectly normal. And we're saying, okay, well, that's okay, and that's also okay, but that's extremely different to that visually. And sometimes you don't think about that. You know that fundamentally the problem we're trying to solve from a technological perspective is hugely difficult. So we've looked at an industry called toxicologic pathology. Basically all drugs go through drug safety evaluation, they go through animal studies, and as a result, there's about 10 million animals involved in that process annual, about 200 million slides, about 5,000 pathologists, and about 80% of that content is perfectly normal because you're not giving drugs to these animals to kill them, you're giving drugs to these animals to prove that they don't do anything to people, okay? So on that basis, most of the stuff these guys are looking at every day is normal, 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 okay? So, Toxological studies are complex because effectively you want to look at every single organ in the animal model, top to tail, and basically evaluate whether you see indicators of toxicity in that particular system. And as a result, you have multiple species with multiple organs with multiple indications of toxicity. And I could probably have drawn another arm, which is multiple manifestations of each of those toxicities visually. You know, so effectively you have a huge training problem. So what if we took a slightly different view on it and said, hold on a minute, there's something not right about this, you know? Instead of worrying too much about what it is or how it manifests, what if we just say, it's not right, it's abnormal, okay? And this, for these guys, is really, really important because 80% of what they see every day is normal. They want to find the needle in the haystack. So all they need to know is it's abnormal, okay? So our product, as a company, we're very focused on the concept of building a generalized abnormality detection engine which basically gives you insight, and it works on the premise of building a model entirely by looking at normal material. It doesn't use abnormal content whatsoever. 
By looking at normal material, there's no annotation overhead. You can basically develop a model and then apply a deviation from that normality and look at that as, a, as an output. Okay? So this is an example here. There's some uh, hyperplasia and fibrosis in here, in this liver. And you can see, for, for example, the way it's, it's perfectly indicated and highlighted all of the different areas of abnormality in this slide. Now, some other cool things, like baculation, you can see, for example, here, it actually picks out the holes, the bits that are missing, rather than the bits that are hyperplasia, mineralization, basophilic tubules, etc., etc. Now, another interesting project we've started on the human pathology side is we're very interested in gastrointestinal pathology. We think, again, it's a very interesting area where about 65% of these endoscopic mucosal biopsies that are taken every day of the week are pretty much normal as well, okay? So again, for us, it's about trying to help rationalize that content and help the pathologist get to the hard stuff, if that makes sense, rather than trying to diagnose the hard stuff for them, which is slightly different in the context of a lot of what you see out there today. So we basically set up a project with GI Partners of Illinois, a large group of gastroenterologists in the greater Chicago area. Um, they're gonna provide us with about 30,000 cases over the next three years, and that process has started already. We're in the process of gathering content and, and digitizing that content as we speak. So that would be probably sort of a very, very valuable training resource, basically, and a, a testing resource for our systems. So just some examples, healthy colon, perfectly good. Low-grade adenoma, that's the area marked by the pathologist. Our system also detects it. Severe colitis, again, the whole thing is screwy. There we go. Um, Adenoma, again, that region is highlighted ahead of the other regions. And again, we can then start to apply segmentation to that, measure it, and then we can start to correlate it with severity of disease and outcome, okay? Again, this is very early data, but obviously from 300 cases to 30,000 cases, we'll learn a lot more. Obviously, there's a continuous improvement process. If you look here, our blues are kind of false negative, or false positive, should I say. And obviously, as we move forward in time, we see an evolution decrease in the amount of false positives with every new model we try and evolve. So, but I think one of the challenges we have in the industry is a lot of people are building engines, but very few people are building cars. And I think in some ways, you know, just because you have an engine that will provide perspective or insight on whether something is normal or abnormal or whether something is cancer or not cancer, ultimately that has to be deployed within application software in a way that the user can actually benefit from it. So we've been thinking a little bit about this paradigm as well. And you know, again, as I said, great engine, demands a great vehicle. Don't have that one, unfortunately, but uh, we're, we're working towards it, but anyway. Uh, so yeah, so we went and we talked to people like Janssen, AstraZeneca, the preclinical side, got great insight, great collaboration. We actually have a two million EU grant with Janssen to pursue further this particular development. As, as it stands, AstraZeneca have been really, really helpful for us as well, to kind of deploy this technology in, in, in the real world, so to speak. How do we use it? How do we practically use it in the hands of the pathologist? And we got this inspiration from, this is a, a long-standing paper, Pathology Visions paper, San Diego, 2008. This guy, whoever he was, was a real visionary. He was 10 years ahead of his time, basically. And he saw a view of the world where, ultimately, you had all your animals along here, all your organs down here, and you had a heat map, basically, which would say, not right, not right, not right. Go look at those ones, you know? So quickly identifying what you want to find and moving in to look at that. Now we interpreted that a little bit, okay? And we came up with something that looks a little bit like this, which is basically a large montage. You can slice and dice your data as much as you want. Ultimately, you can see here, for example, we've sorted these by dose group, and you can see that the high dose group slides here where the animals are actually getting high doses of the drug are actually exhibiting indications of toxicity. You go in, you look, and you can observe the areas of interest there. It's like so. It's a really cool way of basically finding the needle in a haystack really, really quickly, basically. So, what is the future? And we come back to our ROI, and you know, we come back to all of these companies. Ultimately, for us to get a half a billion a year out of the industry, we have to get rid of about 20 to 30% of slide reporting, in my view. That's about what I think, anyway. You know what I mean? So ultimately, pathologists will be not seeing about 30% content-wise of what they're seeing today. And I think that view is very much kind of reinforced by this concept where you take all of your data, you push it through the system, you get the low complexity stuff triaged out, okay? And ultimately, you look at the hard stuff. You look at the more challenging cases, more difficult cases, you're classifying materials, you're doing, you're doing the stuff that a pathologist should be doing, so to speak. 
And I think that clearly this brings risk, as we've seen in the cervical screening process in Ireland, false negative rates, et cetera, et cetera. You know what I mean? The, this is where the, the ultimate challenge lies. When people see this slide, they go, well, what about the false negatives? And that's always going to be the challenge. But ultimately, as the tech improves, it has to be implemented in such a way that, first of all, it augments services, and then it supports replacing services effectively. Because ultimately, people have to gain trust that they can let it do some of the more menial tasks. So I think we've heard this narrative many, many times. As I said before, you've got this whole world of increasing supply-demand dynamics, pressure on the service to deliver, OK? And really, AI will not replace anybody. Like, we're just going to get busier and busier and busier, and it will be seen as ultimately the ultimate kind of help to the pathologist day to day to help them get through their work faster, more efficiently, so they can play more golf on nice golf courses like this and uh, enjoy their life a little bit more. And I think I just want to thank a few people, uh, more, more so partners and collaborators, and that is that. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you very much.